So I just finished filming this 2009 Corolla with a Misfire and I decided it's a perfect time to make this announcement. So Paul Danner and myself, we decided to team up to host a class. It's gonna be a Brandon Steckler in-cylinder pressure transducer class. Uh, we're bringing Brandon to Pittsburgh at Rosedale Technical Institute May 30th. Now, the reality of it is Paul's doing 99% of the work. I'm just a cheerleader here, but uh, I'm a good cheerleader, right? So May 30th, here in Pittsburgh at Rosedale Technical Institute. And the best part about it is all proceeds, all profits are going towards uh, student scholarships at Rosedale Technical Institute. So just want you all, just want you all to be aware. And if you have any interest in learning what I'm about to show you in this upcoming video, where I'll be using Paul sensors, uh, and you wanna learn these things from who I learned them from, you're gonna wanna take this Brandon Steckler class. Also, I just recently found out that Paul uh, donated all his merchandise sales uh, to charity. So I got myself a Scanner Danner shirt and I think you should head all over to his, his page also and buy something for yourself. And I hope you enjoy this video. Welcome back. Today I have a 2009 Toyota Corolla with a 1.8 liter. Uh, I came in for a cylinder for misfire but I can't get the misfire monitors to actually work on this. It's missing pretty bad. Uh, it was at another shop local to me. It had three new ignition coils put in it, four spark plugs, four injectors, and last but not least, which is my favorite, is a brand new PCM. So I pulled this in and I disconnected my fuel injectors because, well, on this engine, that's the easiest way to get this thing not to run. They're right in front. And I'm gonna crank this over. I hope you guys can hear this and you'll see why I'm making this video. Were you able to hear that? Ah, that's the sound of a dead hole. Um, so this thing did not need ignition coils, it did not need spark plugs, it did not need injectors, and it did not need a PCM. Um, I'm gonna grab a relative compression waveform. I'm gonna show you guys how to hook up an amp clamp so you can take a relative compression waveform. Um, I'm gonna sync it to cylinder one, and I'm also going to add an intake pulse just because it's something I like to do have my high amp clamp. Um, it's good to know that these things are, these things can be converted. You don't need to have a Pico scope to use these. This is one millivolt for every amp. So I'm gonna be using my Autel. Everybody kept asking me to use my Autel. So that's what I'm gonna be using. I'm gonna put it on a 500 millivolt scale, which is 500 amps. Um, turn it on, arrow faces the flow of current right onto my negative battery uh, cable. So I'm just gonna back probe here at this IGT. Um, if you don't know what IGT is, I just made a video on Toyota ignition systems. This here is gonna sync our relative compression waveform uh, to cylinder one. So put this right on the channel B. And last but not least, my purge hose is right here on the front. It runs from the purge valve at the back uh, through a metal line down here. The purge valve is usually the best place to get an intake pulse from. And it's always a good idea. And these sensors are so sensitive, it's a good idea to hang them. Oh crap. Just the engine vibration will give you a will give you a waveform. So got this hanging up. I'm gonna hook that to channel C. All right. So like I said, 500 millivolt scale for channel A because that's gonna be my high, high amp clamp. Channel B, going to use a 20 volt division. Um, it's a zero to five volt square wave. 
I don't want the square wave to take over uh, the majority of my screen. So I'm going to use a 20 volt division. And channel C is going to be my pulse sensor. I'm going to use a two volt scale for that. I'm going to bring this down. I'm going to use one second division because I'm able to zoom in. All right, I got the scope hooked up. I'm going to crank this over. And I'm going to jump back over right here and I'm going to pause it and go back a screen. So you see my green traces. Every time cylinder one fires, you get the green trace. So this here is gonna be my relative compression waveform. Every time a piston's coming up on this compression stroke, the starter draws more current uh, depending on the compression. The higher the compression, the more current is needed to spin the engine over. So you're able to see this cylinder one is high, three, four, and two. I got that from the firing order. Um, so cylinder one, three, four, two. Now, you can obviously see cylinder three and four is low, lower than one and two. And I'm gonna discuss that for a minute. So you see my intake pulse. You see this pressure spike in my intake pulse. Your intake pulse should be even. You see these three, they should be even. So then you have to ask yourself why. And your first reaction is, every time cylinder three is coming up on this compression stroke, it's pushing uh, pressure into the intake. So you may think that you have a bad intake valve, and a lot of times you do. But there's another, there's another part in play here. You also have low compression. Remember, one, three, four, and two. So cylinder three and four are low. How do those two play together? I'm gonna pull up this overlay chart made by the drivability guys. Choose a firing order, one, three, four, two. Sink off cylinder one. We're gonna drag this over, line it up right with our ignition coil vents. Make this a little bigger. So this here's my compression. You can see cylinder three is on its compression stroke. When cylinder three is on the compression stroke, cylinder four is on the intake. So what I believe is actually happening is when cylinder three is on the compression stroke, it is pushing air into cylinder four and cylinder four has the intake valve open, which is why you have this spike. So then you have to ask yourself why when cylinder four is on its compression stroke, why you don't have that spike also. So you just have to scoot on over. You see that when cylinder four is on its compression stroke, cylinder three is on its power stroke. So when it's on its power stroke, all of the uh, valves are closed, which is why you don't see that extra spike. Now, Obviously, you have cylinder three and cylinder four low at the same time. Most likely, it's gonna be a head gasket issue. It's pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory. It's engine mechanical 101. But I did wanna show you what these waveforms will look like, and I'm also gonna show you uh, a leak down test and how they, how they actually do, how, how I actually am failing. I know you all are gonna make fun of me for this, but I don't have a real leak down tester. I just use a regulator and put 100 PSI in it. So I do leak downs a little bit differently than most people. I just keep air in it. And I roll the engine over until, I, until the engine gets tight. 
I know this is not how a lot of people do it, uh, but it's the quickest way for me to do it. Alright, so the ratchet just got tight. I'm gonna make sure I'm on top dead or actually bottom dead center. I check um I check leak downs on bottom dead center. So I know that was loud, but I wanted to show you that with uh, 100 PSI going into cylinder three, it was leaking out of cylinder four with the uh, engine on its compression stroke. Why do I do bottom dead center? Well, I do it that way because that way if there's any issues with the cylinder walls, if there's a crack in the cylinder walls, I'm also doing a leak down test on that as well, not just the head like you would if you were doing on top dead center. Now there are times I do it on top dead center, but usually this is the fastest way for me. Everyone does it differently. Is my way better than others? I don't know, but this, this works for me and uh, it's how I've always done it. It's probably, probably gonna be the way I continue doing it. So, so I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, I wanted to show you how I check compression. Um, this car should have been diagnosed within 10 minutes when it went to that other garage. And I feel bad saying that, but the reality of it is, you know, if you're not good at diagnosing vehicles, leave it to someone who is. It's not worth customers paying this exorbitant amount of money uh, and their car's still not running right. So <laughs> now I have to be the one to tell them that they need an engine. And I'm gonna get a lot of questions about why I'm recommending an engine. And the reason I'm recommending an engine on this it's because it has 210,000 miles, and I've seen these failures um, in the past. Usually what happens is the block gets extremely pitted between cylinders uh, one and two or three and four. I've seen it on both ends. Uh, so pitted that it can't be machined out. So me disassembling this just to tell the customer that they need an engine anyhow, it just doesn't feel right to me. So I'm just gonna recommend an engine. Um, we'll see if they go for it, if they do, a, Maybe I'll do my first R and R video, but I'm not sure if they will or not. Um, but I guess I'll see you guys next time.